Lately, the left has been insisting that the word woke is powerless and outdated. Or as Michelle Goldberg smugly argued in the New York Times, the right's obsession with wokeness is a sign of weakness. Nearly every mainstream news outlet has published articles making the same claim. They couldn't be more wrong. They pull this move every time they're cornered. It's a great way to escape personal responsibility and to avoid the consequences of their terrible ideas. The worst part is they usually get away with this cowardly move. Today's guest gave a fantastic speech at this year's ARC conference, the Anti-Davos Conference, put on by Jordan Peterson. As a comedian, podcaster, and political commentator, today's guest has spent years warning people in the West that woke culture was on its way, making it the subject of his book, An Immigrant's Love Letter to the West. He offers what he jokingly describes as politically non-binary options uh, and opinions on culture, politics, and comedy. His podcast, Trigonometry, features interviews with many of the interesting and provocative voices of our time. Please welcome today's podcast guest, Konstantin Kissin. Before we get to Constantin, the Good Ranchers Black Friday Your Way sale is live and something you don't want to miss. This November, you get to pick your favorite meat to get free for a year. You can pick a year of free chicken, steak, salmon, bacon, whatever, when you subscribe to any box right now. Better yet, when you subscribe to any box on GoodRanchers.com, you're not only going to get a free gift of meat worth up to four hundred and eighty dollars, but you also get $15 off with my special code, Glenn. If you're craving hand-cut top sirloin steaks, searching for wild-caught salmon fillets, praying for better-than-organic chicken breasts, or perhaps the mouth-watering applewood smoked bacon, if so, shop Good Ranchers right now. Because right now, the choice is all yours. Subscribe at GoodRanchers.com and you could save up to $500 with their Black Friday offer. Claim your year of free meat, $15 off, and free shipping with the promo code Glenn at GoodRanchers.com. GoodRanchers.com. Constantin, how are you? Glenn, how are you? I am very good. <laughs> we asked each other the same questions. I am very well as well. Yeah. Um, are you in London now? I am. Yeah. You live in London. Uh, it's, see, I, I read a, a story today where um, one of the police officers uh, said to a press person when they were asked, why are they letting the Palestinians just kind of go a little wild. He said, because there's more of them than us, which is a little frightening, a little terrifying. Um, what is happening in London? Well, what you just described, we've had five weeks now where uh, people have been, uh, look, there's been large protests. A lot of the people there are there for, perfectly reasonable protest to express their opinion, but uh, some of them are not. Some of them are chanting things like jihad, rise up, rise up, army of Muhammad. Uh, and when, as you say, uh, members of the public say to the police, why aren't you stopping this? They say there is more of them than there is of us, which is interesting because uh, only uh, two days ago, on Saturday, we had Remembrance Sunday, which is when we commemorate uh, British soldiers killed in World War One, uh, And there were some... Uh, non-pro-Palestine protesters, they were described as counter-protesters, uh, who <clears throat> who were there as well. And uh, the police seemed to have absolutely no problem uh, isolating a large group of them and arresting them. So it seems to me really that the way that Britain is being policed at the moment is if you can get enough of your friends together to threaten and intimidate the police, they will not get involved with your protest. If there's not quite enough of you to be scary, well, they won't. I, I just read this, this headline uh, today, London. Uh, former British Prime Minister David Cameron uh, made an unexpected return to high office on Monday, becoming Foreign Secretary, a major shakeup of the Conservative government that also saw the firing of uh, divisive Home Secretary Suella Braverman. <laughs> and when I saw the word mm. divisive, I thought, 
oh, she must be she must be full of common sense. Uh, I don't know Quite. anything. She must be telling the truth. Right. She must be principled. She must be speaking for the silent majority. She must be saying things that most people in the country believe. Absolutely. I'm so It's so funny that we have got to a point where when you hear one word, you instantly know yeah. uh, everything about that person. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, uh, so Ella Braverman is, I think she's a second generation immigrant. I myself am a first generation immigrant. And what she's saying is we need to stop illegal immigration. This is very controversial of course you understand because yeah. people have a, a right uh, to come to the country sure. <laughs> with with no no checks and controls as we of course all know um in fact i was doing an interview with the with times radio the times of london radio a, a week ago and I, I made this point about illegal immigration and uh, the presenter said to me hold on constantine but you're an immigrant why don't these people have as much of a right <laughs> as you to come and I said to her, no one has a right to come anyway. It's up to the people of Britain or the people of America to decide who comes, when, in what number, for what purpose, etc. And um, this is just, uh, we've got to a point, I think somewhere in the mid-90s, uh, this thing happened where we went from immigration is good and that's why we manage it, we control it, we invite people who are going to be beneficial to our country, uh, to immigration is a moral good. And it's something that must happen irrespective of how it happens, irrespective of what the numbers are, et cetera. So Sola Bravman was one of the people who, one of the very few people who was willing to be honest about that issue. She was one of the very few people who was prepared to be honest about policing double standards. This is the thing that really got her fired. She dared, Glenn, to point out that when we had BLM protests, the police kneeled in front of the protesters. Mm. And when a couple of months later we had anti-lockdown protests, the police kneeled on the protesters. <laughs> she made that point. Uh, and uh, this was immediately uh, described as uh, undermining the police. Uh, whereas a, a lot of people, I think, in, in the public think that it's police double standards that are undermining confidence in the Correct. police. But uh, there you go. <laughs> So, um, so the, when I was over in London recently, um, there were places that I was told, oh no, you don't want to go. I think Paddington station was one of them. Um, and <laughs> I, I went through a few places in London where it could have been Baghdad if it wasn't for the uniquely, um, English buildings, it could have been Baghdad there. It did not look at all like um, like London. And that's, you know, that's, I guess, racist to say in today's world. But it's not because there's no assimilation, no assimilation. When that's not happening, how long is London or the West going to survive? Come on, Glenn, stop being racist. Diversity is our strength, man. <laughs> how? <laughs> Divide and conquer. <laughs> I mean, how? That's what everyone says. I'm just telling you what the, the party line is. The party line is diversity is our strength. Uh, well, and diversity can be our strength if everybody who comes from different places comes together and says, we are all American. Yes. Or we are all British. Yes. We all we all subscribe to the same ideas. Correct. We all believe in the, in the future of our country. We want to live by a broadly similar set of rules. Our, our we all believe that men and women are equal, for Correct. example, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, um, but what we have is something else. We don't have that, uh, which is what I think a healthy multi-ethnic society looks like. Uh, we have multiculturalism, and that's the idea that people should be free to live any which way they want, speak any language they want, integrate or not integrate, up to them really, uh, and uh, you know operate completely in complete isolation from the country to which they've come, and when there's enough of them to demand that that country becomes more like the country from which they came. We have a – our country's motto is e pluribus unum, from many, mm -hmm. one. We're not one anymore. There's nothing – that none of the big principles bring us together. And when I hear people on the street quoting Hitler, I and and I'm so used now to be calling be called a Nazi because and I don't know how I've won the Defender of Israel Award. <laughs> I, I don't know how I'm uh, anti-Semite, but somehow or another, I'm an anti-Semitic Nazi. And then I hear people on the streets quoting Hitler I wonder, is anyone going to wake up from this? Are there? No. 
No, 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 no. These people who spent seven years at least calling everybody a Nazi, they don't recognize Nazis when they see them. And it's interesting because the counter protesters we talked about a second ago, they were uh, described as the far right in in all the media publications in this country. Uh, They were held up as the real problem. And I keep saying to people, when I think of what we in the UK call the far right, I know it's a little bit different over in the US, but in the UK, when we talk about the far right, what we mean is, People who are racist, people who are homophobic, people who think that women are second class citizens and should be treated as such, and people who believe in the use of violence to achieve their political objectives. We've had the far right on the streets of our city for five weeks, and it doesn't look like these counter protesters. It looks like people shouting for jihad, rise up, rise up, army of Mohammed, and as you say, praising Hitler. But if you import lots of people from places where praising Hitler is normal, this is what happens. So where do we go from here how do how do we i mean your your government and our government is just getting weaker and weaker it's it's honestly if you had to judge them by their actions they're all in with blm protests burning cities they're all in with uh, hamas just judging by their actions so, I think it's much worse than that. I don't think they're all in. I think they don't know what to do. They're scared. They're terrified. We have a political system that filters out, certainly in this country, anyone who's prepared to speak the truth. I mean, we just talked about one example of it. The yeah. one politician in the Conservative Party who was willing to be honest uh, is the one that they've got rid of. Uh, and uh, we have a political system that is calibrated precisely around Uh, making sure that nobody who's actually honest ever reaches a position of power. And if by some miracle they do, we get rid of them. Um, And uh, I don't know how that changes. When I speak to my Jewish friends in the UK, I'll be honest with you, most of them are talking about leaving. To go where? Israel? I, I... Probably not Israel. Uh, Maybe they they hope that that America is a place that still holds on to its values. I I hope so, too. But I I'm shocked. But why? But on what I'm seeing all across America, I mean, shocked. I've been been warning about it. This is why the ADL uh, has called me, uh, you know, a Nazi and anti-Semite, because I've been warning about the seeds of the Holocaust there. They've been planted here for 15, 20 years, and nobody's nobody's looking at what's sprouting up everywhere. And uh, mm. and I guess it's you, you, you're a Nazi if you say, hey, we should pull those weeds from the garden and make sure that they don't grow. And now here they are. And it's worse than I thought. Well, what you have is a combination of two things, both very dangerous. One is obviously <clears throat> Western countries now have significant populations of people who uh, and I'm not talking about peaceful, moderate Muslims here. I'm talking yeah, about Islamists. We, we have we have a population uh, big enough of Islamists now, uh, and uh, they uh, they seem to get along very well, inexplicably so, uh, with all of these uh, woke idiots that have been created on college campuses and in schools. And th- this is where the beautiful, I mean, this is a magical phenomenon of queers for Palestine comes from. <laughs> it's people who, who don't understand anything about the place about which they're talking about. And Glenn, I, I, I am actually starting a movement. I'd like people like us to get together and start fundraising for one-way tickets to Gaza for all of these people so they can experience the true benefits of everything that they're praising. Um, hopefully, that, that may be a way to solve the problem. I, I, I don't... This way... Is it stupidity? Is it just that? Is it yes. just stupidity? Yes. It is. Yes. It's stupidity and ideology. And this is the point that I think... Uh, People in the West, and I'm someone who was born in the Soviet Union, so I have a slightly outsider's perspective. We are victims of our own success here in the West. Yes. We've built some of the most incredible societies in the history of humanity, including, by the way, on those very progressive values that these people love to talk about. When, if you, you know, if, if, if you care about women's rights, where is a better place to be a woman than the United States of America? If you care about gay rights, where is a better place to be gay than the United States of America? If you care about all sorts of other issues, where is a better place to be than the United States of America and other Western countries? Nowhere. But because we have given our citizens all these incredible opportunities where they don't have to think about anything other than, you know, wake up, go to work, make money, have time with my family, etc. They're incredibly susceptible to ideology. And the one thing we've forgotten in the West 
which strikes me as odd, given that you only have to look back about 80 years to see how powerful ideology really is. Yeah. Um, we've forgotten that if you brainwash people long and hard enough, and if you, uh, if you don't teach them the values of your own society and instead teach them to hate the values of your own society, you will very quickly end up in a place where these people hate your own society. And as long as American schools and American colleges continue to teach young Americans that America is evil, then you will see the scenes that you see on the streets of America where you have all these young people tearing down American flags uh, from, uh, you know, various posts and, and whatever, uh, because uh, this is what they believe. And and why would we be surprised about that when they have spent their entire life being educated by people who hate your country and its values? So how do you how do you turn somebody around? You meet somebody and they're they're honest, but they're stupid or they're in, but they believe it, but they'll have a conversation with you. What do you say to them? Mm. Travel. Travel, buy a ticket, fly somewhere else, go to another part of the world, see how the rest of the world lives. See how the rest of the world lives. I bet you people who go over to other countries, go to somewhere in Central Asia where I grew up in Uzbekistan. See how people live in Uzbekistan and then tell me America is bad. Tell me America is bad after you've been there. Go, go somewhere else, go to Thailand, go to Cambodia, go to, go to some part of the world where people are not quite as rich or as free as you. Tear down their flag. Go to Cambodia and tear down the Cambodian national flag in front in front of the parliament building there, or in front of one of the buildings there. Try it. Try it. See what happens. Go to North Korea. It's it's the this it's the socialist utopia that you keep telling me about. You know, I only grew up in the Soviet Union. You must know better. Mm. Go there. Go to North Korea. Have a look. See what happens there. You know, you you can't speak freely in America. Okay, try there. Let's find out. Travel. Uh, th that's one thing that, you know, seeing is believing. This is why people are so, I don't know if you saw, I wrote an article for the Free Press about, uh, called The Day the Delusions Died, yes. about October the 7th massacre. Um, seeing is believing. This is why people are so shocked and I, uh, by the events of recent days but and it recent changed, weeks. It and changed can, you too, though, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I'll be honest with you, Glenn, I, and this is probably the first time that I've said this, so people who watch a lot of my stuff will, 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 will be surprised, but I've spent the last six years since we started Trigonometry, my YouTube show, and since I've become a, a public commentator, really saying I'm very concerned about the things that are happening on the left, but I come from the left, I'm somewhere in the center, there are a lot of things that trouble me on the right, and, and all of those things are still true. Right. But as of, as of five weeks ago, my my view is um, this isn't the time for for ambivalence. Uh, there is a side that wants me killed, and there's a side that doesn't. I'm going to go with the one that doesn't. Back with more Constantin in just a second. Uh, I've been telling you about Jace Medical, one of our sponsors, for some time now, and it is needed now more than ever. There are already critical, crucial shortages of essential drugs right here in the United States. You wouldn't think of that happening in America. It's never happened in my lifetime. Normally it wouldn't, but these are not normal times. This is why I recommend the Jace case. Keep this on hand. It is a personalized emergency medication kit that first contains five essential antibiotics, which treat the most common and deadly bacterial infections. It is customizable with dozens of add-on medications available, so you can choose the ones that fit your family and your family's need. They even have ivermectin as an add-on option. They have all kinds of medicines, your heart medicine, uh, if you have diabetes, you can get all of it, and you can get a year's worth. Go online, fill out the form, and you get your prescription life-saving medications delivered right to your door. Jace case from Jace Medical. Go to Jace Medical, J-A-S-E Medical.com. Use the promo code BECK. Uh, it is really hard because it's hard to find, you know, in World War II, there was there were some clear good guys. There, there was, you know, there was Winston Churchill. There was, um, you know, FDR, good guys, generally speaking, um, that were standing up for those principles. But I don't see anyone but the public and the public that's being shut up and shouted down where do you see, do you see a, a leader or because we do have to take a stand but it seems like we would be taking a stand against everyone with power agreed i i think the, the one reason that i am 
well, I mean, optimistic would probably be overstating it at this point. But the one ray of light and ray of hope that I see is I think new media is changing the way we have these conversations. New media being what you and I are doing right yeah. now. Uh, six years ago, my friend Francis Foster and I, we were two idiot comedians, uh, never thought about politics really in any sort of way. We start a YouTube show. We're approaching a million subscribers six year, years later. We are probably the biggest independent uh, cultural and political show in the UK that mm. talks about these issues. Um, as uh, our voices grow, uh, we will give courage to leaders who are willing to come through, who see that there's a constituency out there for what they're trying to do. Uh, and Serla Braverman, who we've been talking about, I think potentially is one of those people. Uh, there may be others too, uh, who over the course of the next few years see that there is a constituency out there for the things that they're saying. Yeah. Uh, and we have to encourage people to be to be brave. And also, this is the, th the thing with Serla Braverman. I mean, she has been fired. Uh, I wonder though, because we, as you probably know, have an election coming up next year. Uh, <laughs> in that election, her party is gonna get crushed. Obviously, they're going to get destroyed. Um, what happens then? When Because the, that sort of destruction is an opportunity for reinvention. And at that point, maybe uh, there will come leaders who don't care as much as, about Guardian headlines as they do about what their own voters think. Maybe that will happen. How do we get to a place to where, um, because you said, you know, the right <coughs> is different in America it is the true right in America is the smallest government you can get before anarchy. So mm -hmm. don't empower the government to have enough power to do any of those things. Um, but it's often confused even here in America with people, you know, that uh, may be racist or whatever. I tend, I tend to put those people on the very far left, total control, and and yeah. anarchy um but you have a lot of people who are regular people who have been shouted down for so long and shut up and it's honestly if i mean i couldn't design a better priming for civil war or for um you know for really truly anarchy and 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 the people shouting out somebody make all of this stop um, I mean, we're being primed. How do you, what do you say to people who are kind of at the end of their rope here in the next year as we head towards elections? We're mm. constantly being primed for violence because nobody will do anything that we all know is common sense and right. What do you say to those people? How do they? Well, look. I, I try not to get involved in American politics because, you know, outsiders telling you guys how to run your country. No, but I think it's the same in Britain, though, it. isn't it? But it is. It is. I know. I know. I would, I, 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 there are things that I would say. I think hard as it is, I think people have to resist the urge uh, for violence and resist the urge for chaos because all that will happen is they will use it against you. Um, and so we have to start to build our own institutions. We have to start to build our own schools, our own universities, whether it's homeschooling, uh, our own media organizations. You know, my view is the media empires of the future are going to be built in the next 10 years. Yes. Uh, that is the opportunity. The legacy media is dying. It's dying for a very good reason. If you think about what television is, it's mm -hmm. fake people in a fake room having a fake conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, what we are doing is the opposite of that, it, hopefully. And uh, people respond well to that. We've seen that in recent years. So as the leg legacy media dies, their, 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 their sort of clutching of power is, you know, the death grip that they have on, on communication and what people see uh, will be loosened somewhat. And in that, in that space, there's an opportunity to start to change people's minds. I mean, uh, there are lots of people that I meet, young people who say, well, you know, when, when I started watching your show, I thought this, but now I think that. You know, people are... Uh, are able to be persuaded uh, and uh, ultimately all ideology clashes with reality we are seeing quite a lot of that now I know a lot of people whose minds were changed very quickly when they saw the way portions of their own side responded to the terrorist attacks on October 7th um, so uh, we I, I suspect that the future over the next few years is the continual clashing of people's ideas with reality and out of that I mean look 
but you're not wrong. I mean, the joke that I've, I've half jokingly always used when people ask me if I'm interested in moving to the US is I'm like, why don't you guys have your civil war first, then I'll move over. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's sort of feels like where, where America's at. Well, um, but it doesn't, I, I it, traveled to- it doesn't it feel, because I, it's being posited here in America that it is the left versus the right or left versus mm-hmm. right anywhere. It's really not. It feels like no. the elites versus the people. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, and uh, I think that is really a product of social media. I mean, the digital revolution that we're living through has fundamentally broken the way that we perceive uh, right. reality, yeah. the way we consume information. Uh, and it, it's not without consequence. It, it's a really dangerous time that we're living through. One of the things that was really struck me in the last few weeks, Glenn, is that when you see uh, you see these like pop, vox pops of people being asked questions on, on the street, for example, people who are asked about uh, you know, why are you here? Why have you got this Hamas banner or whatever? Uh, you know, wh- what about the attack, the terrorist attack? And they say, what terrorist attack? Because we all now receive our own information that we have been pre-selected to be fed in order to reinforce the ideas that we already have. So it is a very dangerous moment. And, and uh, there is a, a, a need for uh, people to use social media responsibly. It's, I think, 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now, we're going to look back at it like we look at tobacco companies now saying, oh, you know, mm. smoke, it's good I for you. So. Uh, I, think, I, I think the social media companies... Uh, unintentionally, almost certainly unintentionally, have created tools that really drive us apart. And we're going to have to reckon with that in a very powerful way. That is one of the reasons I'm very grateful. You know, I have some reservations, uh, obviously, as you do with anybody, about the way Elon Musk has been handling Twitter. But I actually think on balance he's been doing a very good job. And that is because Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it, is now the one place that if you want accurate information and you're discerning enough to be able to get it, you can get it. Uh, the media no longer have a lock on what you can see. Mm-hmm. And that is valuable. The downside of that is a lot of people only see what they want to see. Mm. Um, well, that's, um, it's kind of, it's, it's weird because when we only had three uh, television stations or networks here in America, we only saw what we were allowed to see. Um, I mean, the mm. BBC, I don't, think the bbc is going to go down without a massive fight i mean i i walked by that building and looked at that building and thought my gosh the power of the bbc Mm. they're not gonna let that slip through their fingers easily um no i doubt it but 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 the thing is you know they don't know how not to let it slip through their fingers. The problem is that ultimately it's about are you providing things that other people like and think are valuable uh, and the BBC is, for example, desperately trying to start a load of podcasts, but all of them fail, even though the BBC is willing to put taxpayers' money into funding them. Mm. And the reason they fail is it's not what the people want, it's what the elites want the people to want. Um, and so uh, ultimately, I, I, I'm very, very optimistic about the future of media. I think we're going to win that fight. And the reason we're going to win that fight is the reason that we're having this conversation, which is, as you said, there is a silent majority of people who've had enough. Um, When you look at um, because, first of all, you're uh, from Russia originally or the Soviet Union. Mm. Uh, You grew up there Mm. when you were 12. What was life like then? So I grew up in the late phases of the Soviet Union and then the early phases of Russia uh, before P- Vladimir Putin came to power. So I kind of saw the collapse of the Soviet Union and then the early few years of, of modern Russia. Uh, the Soviet Union was a very interesting place because I, I talk about this in the first chapter of my book, An Immigrant's Love Letter to the West. Uh, even then, the power of the Soviet Union was waning. But I remember my parents giving me what uh, people now talk about the talk that they sometimes have to give their kids about, you know, don't be rude to police officers, otherwise you'll get in trouble, you're going to get mm. shot, etc. My parents had to give me the talk, which was a talk that I think increasingly parents in America are going to have to start giving their children, which is you're going to go to school and they're going to teach you a bunch of BS uh, about you, you, about your parents, about society, etc. Here's what the real truth is. So when they tell you all this stuff, just pretend they're not telling you, ignore it, etc. That is the sort of conversation we were having at the time. 
because it was society in which you were being indoctrinated with ideology, even as it was collapsing and losing its power. Um, and that is one of the, my, my most formative memories, just being told by my parents that I have to, A, not believe most of the things I'm being taught at school outside of, you know, math and, and history and geography and so on, and even history, quite mm -hmm. suspect at times the way we were being taught. But also then being warned not to say anything at school. And this is, again, a conversation that I think parents across America are likely to start having with their kids as well, which is like, make sure you don't say anything because your parents could get in trouble. Uh, make sure you don't talk about the stuff that we talk about around the dinner table with uh, with people at school because you might get us in trouble and then the whole family is going to be in trouble. So that's what I grew up with. And that's why, you know, uh, among our audience, probably one of the biggest sort of most visible portions of my audience is people who say to me, I'm from Eastern Europe. I can't believe it's happening. Yeah, again. I hear that all the time. I hear that from people from yep. Venezuela, from Cuba, Eastern Europe. They all know it and they all come up to me almost frantic. What is wrong with you people? What is wrong with the country? Why are you letting this happen? And you're like, because we've never seen it before and we have no experience with it. Uh, you know, I saw an article today from a Biden supporter. The, among the headlines uh, on today's news was the FBI uh, was looking for agents with a former U.S. military background to get them out because they were more likely to be red state Trump. Um, there was another one where they uh, have just shut down. Oh, uh, they're going at the IRS, our tax uh, uh, in bureaucracy. is going after a, a 501c3, a nonprofit that stood against the president on its, everything else. All these weaponization things that are happening. And then the president's spokesperson came out and said, uh, you know, Donald Trump, he's he'll be more he'll be closer to Russia. He the way he'll abuse uh, the rights of individuals, the way he'll use the government. And I thought. I mean, we can get closer to Russia, but we're already on that road. And I, I, I don't see anybody uh, standing up except people who have had the experience. Everybody else is called a conspiracy theory, a theorist. But if you've had mm. the experience, you're just invisible. You just nobody's nobody's hearing from you. That's a little uh, well disheartening. I'm reassured. I think some people are hearing uh, from me and from other people like me, and I'm reassured by that. I think, uh, as we talked about, the, in, among the general public, there is a, a lot of interest. And uh, look, if there is optimism to be found, where it is to be found, I think, is in uh, the fact that more and more people, uh, for all the censorship and the restrictions, and we can talk about that here in the UK and in the US that we've seen, there nonetheless has never been an easier time for, for people like us to disseminate our points of view uh, and disseminate information to the public. We can do it. Uh, and I'm hopeful that um, given that opportunity, truth wins in the end. Um, you know, I'm really encouraged by the success that uh, lots of us are having in mm -hmm. the space by sharing these messages. So I think, I think if there is hope to be found, it's in that. It's in the fact that we are... Uh, allowing people a the first step is to allow people to feel like they've been heard and also to name the problem because a lot of people are walking around they're going i don't really rec i don't understand what's going on but Correct. it feels wrong something is off and when they see an explanation of what's happening that's very helpful to them as well yeah. and eventually from these conversations will come uh, political movements and political leaders i hope who who have uh, the authority of a lot of people behind them. And they have media organizations that are saying the things that they are saying to the public too. More with Constantine in just a second. First, let me tell you about Preborn, our sponsor. Abortion is a tragic part of our lives as Americas, uh, as Americans. And even, even after the overturning of Roe versus Wade, it continues to rob children of the right to live. What's even more devastating is that a majority of women who get abortions say that they would have chosen life if they had more support, if they believe someone would be there for them. Preborn is stepping into that gap. 
Women are being told that, first of all, their babies are clumps of cells. Not true. Preborn blows that out of the water by providing free ultrasounds and postnatal care. Once they've introduced their mother, uh, the mother to their child, she's twice as likely to choose life for her child. That is in and of itself game changing. But then they go on and provide care for up to two years after the birth. So you're caring for the mom and the child. This stands in the gap for life. Support preborn, won't you? You'll not only save lives, you'll empower women. Your donation of $28 will help a woman make a choice that she won't have to regret for the rest of her life. And it gives her the ultimate blessing. Just dial pound 250, say the keyword baby. That's pound 250, keyword baby, or visit preborn.com slash Glenn. You, um, you wrote, and we've already talked about, the day that delusions died. Um, mm -hmm. You said a lot of people woke up on October 7th that it's progressive. They went to bed the night before feeling like conservatives, or they went to bed that night feeling like conservatives. Mm. Um you have a, um, an extra reason um, to feel this way because because you're Jewish. I haven't. I've been asking this question for a while to um, Jewish listeners and friends, and I haven't really had a satisfying answer yet. And maybe it's I'm I'm phrasing it in uh, poorly. Um, if I were, if I had grown up Jewish. I'm just imagining that I had heard all of the stories of the programs and everything else, but they were distant and in the past. And on the seventh, the world stepped into insanity and it just keeps going. What does it feel like? Was that your experience? What does it feel like to have that suddenly become universally real? Mm. Well, I am, as I li always like to say, Jewish, uh, ethnically a little bit Jewish and uh, not religious, not practicing. My family are Orthodox Christians, actually, because Jews in uh, in the Russian Empire were often forced to convert. Right. Uh, so I don't have, you know, I, I'm not part of a Jewish community. I'm not identifiably Jewish. In many ways, my sort of Jewish identity has been thrust upon me by recent events where other people identify me as Jewish. Mm. Because, uh, and this is actually an interesting point, just as, a, as an aside, uh, I think Jewishness is always defined by the anti-Semite, which is, if I were on a plane hijacked by Hamas terrorists, I'd be on the list. Do you know right. what I mean? Yes. Even irrespective of how I feel about Judaism or my ethnicity right. or whatever. Um, but yes, I think that um, for, for, for Jews in the last few weeks, it has become clear that um, all... <laughs> It's it's weird because having predicted so much of this myself, including in my book, it's still hard to believe when it happens. I've been saying for years, Glenn, this ideology is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Importing lots of people from countries that have different values is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Not having a border is very dangerous. But when it happens, it's, it, it's almost like... <sighs> When you said it initially, you didn't really want to believe it, even though you know, you know it's the logical conclusion of what's happening. But seeing is believing, and that's what we've seen in the last few weeks. It's kind of like being told you might have cancer, and you do have cancer. Yes. Very different. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're, you describe yourself as a uh, lapsed atheist. What does that mean mm. exactly? <laughs> That's a good question. So I, I call my generation children of Dawkins, uh, and that is because we grew up reading Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris mm -hmm. and the four horsemen, uh, Christopher Hitchens, of course, the four horsemen of, of, of uh, atheism. Uh, and um, I'm lapsed because, look, I personally live a fulfilled and very happy life without a a belief in a higher being. Mm -hmm. I, I have, I have the sense that all human beings are connected and uh, bound together by something. I don't know exactly what that is, mm -hmm. um, but uh, but I'm not a practicing uh, religious person. I, I go to church every now and again. I have friends who are religious, and I'll tag along and I'll sit there and I get a lot from it. Um, but 
I, I, I can live the rest of my life, I think, not going uh, to church on a regular basis and not going to synagogue or whatever. But when I look at societies that have abandoned that, and when I look at people for who, whose brains work differently to mine, I can see that for them it's not good. It's not healthy. Um, and the sense of alienation and atomization that people feel from each other uh, in our society it makes it clear to me that I think uh, we need some way of binding people together. And more than anything as well, for, for a lot of people, I think they have to have some sense of overcoming the thing that I said in my speech at ARC, which is all death is certain, we're all going to die. How do you cope with that? Uh, and for a lot of people, and I think it, it actually speaks to why we responded to COVID the way that we did. If you have never thought about your own mortality before, and if you're not at peace with your own mortality, then of course you're going to demand the harshest restrictions and everything to be done to protect you. Because if you haven't accepted your mortality, then nothing is more important than death. And there are so many things that are more important than death, Glenn, as you know. So many things. But if you live in a society of people who don't know that, then you end up with the sort of pathologies that we do. So on a personal level, can I make myself believe in a bearded man in the sky? I don't think so. <laughs> do I think we suffer for our lack of religiosity? Yes, I do. So what is the solution? Because here in America, this is terrifying to me. There are groups mm. on the right that now say, you know, the American experiment, it's over, it's outdated. And the reason why we were living in with such suffering is because lack of religion. Uh, and so we should have a, we should have a chosen religion. I find that terrifying myself. I'm a very deeply religious guy, but I don't want my church involved at all. I want my church and everybody else's church to ground people in certain principles that we then live and, and hopefully seek out to vote for. Um, mm. But uh, how do you, how do you change this uh, without going to some sort of horrid the uh, theocratic state? Well, I think uh You'll correct me if I'm wrong, and again, I'm wary of, of giving too much of an opinion about American sure. ways of doing because I haven't lived in America. I, I come to America regularly, and it's a place that I, I love and find very interesting. But um, it strikes me that the idea of having some kind of one top-down religion is an extraordinarily anti-American thing very much to so. suggest, isn't it? Oh, very much so. Uh, I think except, America is founded on— Except if you hmm. believe wokeism is a religion, which I do. Well, it is, of course. It's clearly a religion, and, and it's come into the chasm that is opened up by the by the lack of religiosity in right. our societies. Um, but but I don't think either of us would advocate for that or any no. other religion to be superimposed on, no. on America or on, on the UK. Um, I think uh, I don't actually have an answer of how that that problems gets so that problem gets solved, other than I think that the crisis of meaning and purpose that particularly young people are now going through many, many young people are going through, is such that they will eventually start looking for something. And of course, that's why they found wokeness. It gives them the illusion meaning. of meaning and the illusion of purpose. However, it is extraordinarily unsatisfying. Uh, and they're going to live miserable lives. And some of them are eventually going to decide they don't want to live lives of misery, and they will look for something else. Um, and uh, I also think that Every action causes an equal and opposite reaction. I think you will find uh, the next generation will be pursuing things in a slightly different way. Uh, we already see this if you look at the at the stats for, it's actually, there's a dangerous problem in and of itself, but it's still interesting. Young Gen Zers, the boys are quite yes. based, as we say on the internet. The girls are incredibly woke. But my point is future generations will look at what's happening to their parents' generations and think, oh, that's a bit dumb. Let's do things differently. So I, I think there will be some pushback against this. And a generation of people, I'm, I'm a geriatric millennial, um, <laughs> you know, my, my, my generation 
have suffered a lot for this lack of meaning, meaning and purpose. Uh, and uh, people are going to look for it. And uh, if if there is a version of religion, you know, the problem that my generation had with religion was that it it was a very it felt very authoritarian and top down. And this is what you must do. Whereas I think now there is the scope for people to be told, well, look, we're not telling you how to live your life. Right. I'm not saying this is what you must do. Otherwise, you're evil and you're going to hell. But if you want meaning and purpose, here are some of the ways that historically have worked for human beings to get meaning and purpose. And some of those ways are have a family, be responsible, be accountable, have mm -hmm. community, do things for other people. Uh, you know, con don't consider yourself the most important thing in the world. There are other people around you who matter more than you. Bind yourself to others, connect yourself to others. It, being this idea that being free is the only value that must be pursued at all costs is not factually true. It's true at the level of politics. We want to be free of government as much as possible, but no more than that. But on a personal level, it's not true at all. You don't want to be free. You don't want to be free of other human beings. On the contrary, you want to be bound together right. with people with whom you have a common vision of things, you know, building a business together or building a community together or building, you know, a football team together, whatever it is. Doing things with others is what gives your life meaning, is what imbues you with purpose. And, um, you know, for a lot of people going to a church, that or going to a synagogue or going to a temple, whatever it might be, gives you that meaning and purpose. Uh, whether you need to necessarily believe in the bearded man in the sky, I don't know. In in the UK, we have a lot of people, young people, people my generation and younger, going to church now who don't believe in God, but they just go. Right. Why is so? It, is that the answer? I don't know. I don't know. But I'm just giving you some of the thoughts that I have on it. Let me let me stay with um, the left and the younger generation. Mm. Yeah, I, I understand the younger generation being taught to hate, but there is a visceral hate from the left for the West. Where does that come from? It's the same thing we talked about earlier. I think where it comes from is we are the victims of our own success. Uh, and this navel gazing and the solipsism and the look at us, look how bad we are. It's a product of a society that no longer has to fight for its own survival, that no longer has to struggle, that no longer has to overcome difficult things in order to build a society, in order to build a country. I mean, if you look at the history of the United States, for example, America really only became a powerful and super wealthy country in very recent history. Yes. Very recent history. Prior to that, the, the, the American experience is one of overcoming extraordinary challenges through human ingenuity, through blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, and it's no accident, I think, that you know World War II finishes, and by the 60s, you start to get people who are kind of like, you know, well, what are we supposed to do? I mean, we don't have any big challenges left, yeah. really. Let's, let's look around for something that's wrong. Oh, it's me. Oh, it's my parents. Oh, it's my grandpa. Oh, it's my country. And before you know it, you are where we are. And by the way, you know, I don't know if you're, you are, your viewers are familiar with a guy called Yuri Bezmenov, but th this, uh, this uh, idea of teaching Americans to hate their own country, it's been something that other countries around the world have attempted to infiltrate into American society. And this was used by the Soviets, you'll probably remember this. Uh, whenever anyone criticized the Soviet Union for the things that it was doing, they would say, well, what about the way you treat black people in America? Correct. The idea of creating racial divisions in America, not to say that America didn't have its terrible Problems. racial history, yeah. of course it did, but <laughs> accentuating those and amplifying them, even as now you can see that, in ex you know, undeniably America is a better society racially than it was 60 years ago. Oh, yeah. Even now the amplification of, of those divisions is what China and Russia and America's enemies around the world want. Back with the final chapter with uh, Constantine here in just a second. First, let me take 60 seconds and tell you about Relief Factor. If you are suffering from pain uh, and you've tried everything, will you try, please, Relief Factor? I had pain for six years, maybe seven years, and it got too bad. It was so bad that about five years ago, I told my wife, it was around this time of the year, I think next year is the end of my career. I can't do it anymore, honey. 
And she told me, please try Relief Factor. I didn't think it would work. It's all natural and it reduces inflammation. Honestly, it's just it does not scream Glenn. So um, I tried it because she wouldn't listen to me whine anymore. And it changed my life. Three week quick start. It's 1995, a trial pack. It's not a drug developed by doctors. Hundreds of thousands. I think over a million have now tried Relief Factor. And 70% of them go on to order more month after month. Call 1-800-4-RELIEF, 800-4-RELIEF, or relieffactor.com. Let me uh, switch gears to uh, Ukraine. You were very much for uh, defense of Ukraine, and you've changed. Why? No, I haven't changed. I was very much for helping Ukraine defend itself uh, to the extent that it was possible. Uh, And my thinking behind that was that if we help Ukraine and provide them with the military support that they need, they will do what they have done, which is fight off the Russian aggression, retake a significant portion of their territory, inflict a very significant cost on the Russian military uh, and degrade their ability to continue their invasion and, and do Uh, other things around the world that would be damaging to the interests of the West. Uh, They've done that. People forget in the first three weeks, uh, the Russians attacked from three different sides, from the north, from the east and from the south. They were successful in all three directions. From the north, they nearly reached the capital, Kiev. They were an hour's drive outside. They were on the outskirts of Kiev. Um, Northeast, they nearly captured Kharkiv. In the east, they made a lot of progress. Southeast, they captured Mariupol. And in the south, they took the big city that they really managed to take in the early war was Kherson in the south without actually a fight due to traitors on the Ukrainian side. All of those gains have been pushed back quite significantly other than Mariupol and a strip in the southeast that connects Crimea uh, to the eastern region. So uh, what our support has provided Ukraine is an opportunity to retain its sovereignty, which is what they were fighting for. And I said this a week after the conflict started on the biggest uh, political debate show here in the UK called Question Time. There's a clip on our channel uh, of it. Uh, Ukraine needs to fight. They need to put up a fight. They need to inflict heavy losses on the Russians. Then they were always going to have to trade away territory Mm -hmm. in exchange for the one thing that they really need, which is long term security. And the reason that I am calling for the West to help Ukraine make a deal now is twofold. Number one. We clearly don't have the appetite in the West to provide them with what they need. I wish we did, but we don't. We don't have the appetite to provide them with everything they need to actually retake all of the territory that they've lost. That's not going to happen now. So why prolong the fighting if they're not going to get the equipment they need? All that's happening now is the lines on the map have barely moved for a year. The last major Ukrainian win was the retaking of Kherson a year ago in November 2022. All that's happening now is lots of young men on both sides are being killed for no gain whatsoever. So what's the point of that? And the second reason is this is our opportunity to help Ukraine secure its sovereignty for the long term, which means either NATO membership or some kind of North Korean demilitarized zone, uh, North Korean and South Korean DMZ or something of that nature. Because the most important thing, and I've said this from day one, Glenn, is this cannot be allowed to happen again. It happened in 2014. And the Obama administration did nothing. They looked, they turned a blind eye and allowed the Russians to take the eastern regions, uh, portions of the eastern regions, and take Crimea. We did nothing, so of course they came back again. What the point of helping Ukraine defend itself was to prevent that from ever happening again. Now is the time to put pressure on the Russians and on the Ukrainians to do a deal that prevents this ever happening again. So you have uh, something happening with Ukraine. I mean, the guy who really came up with a plan designed for, uh, for Crimea for uh, Putin was Alexander Dugan. I I assume you are aware of him. He's now yeah. he's now um, shaping uh, Putin's uh, his policies and his uh, language using religious uh, language pretty much. <laughs> In the same way the Iranians are using it now, that we are the great Satan um, and that we are destroying everything that is God. In some ways, I kind of look at it and go, "Uh," you know, we are putting poison throughout the world and the West just on 
you know, transgenderism, all of this stuff with the surgeries and uh, and there is no let, truth. You can't, you can't you can't let them do that to you, though. That's you can't let them do that. That's all that is, is their propaganda in order to demoralize demoralize Americans. Yes, we have problems at home. Uh, but as I said to you, if you would rather, you know, <laughs> where would you rather live in Russia or in yeah. Iran or in America? America. Let's not let. Let's not get confused about this, okay? Yes, Amer America and Western societies are doing a lot of things wrong. I stand against them as you do, and we have a chance of winning that fight. That does not mean that being that the world being ruled by Russia, China, and Iran is a better outcome. And this is one of the reasons that I was so supportive of our support for Ukraine. Uh, I said this at the time, and it's no surprise that it's happening now, Glenn. The leader of Iran, Xi Jinping, the leader of China, Vladimir Putin, the leader of Russia, are, have all been saying the exact same thing. The same phrase comes out over and over again, a multipolar world. What does that mean? That means they want to throw you, America, off the pedestal. That's what they want. And they've wanted it for a long time. And of course they want it. Of course they want to be as rich and as powerful as America. Of course they do. This is why, you know, I got to tell you, it always makes us outside of America laugh when you had those like 1990s American movies where you had this like CIA guy going, they hate us because of freedom. And <laughs> no, they don't hate you because of your freedom. <laughs> they hate you because you're rich and powerful and they want what you have. That's why they hate you. So let's don't allow that propaganda to brainwash you about this. America is a force for good in the world. Uh, I would much rather live in a world that's dominated by the United oh, yeah. States than Russia or China. And I can tell you as someone who, who understands those places pretty well. Uh, so what we have to do is we have to fight domestically for making sure that the American spirit, the British spirit, the British and American values are preserved, that our societies inculcate those values in our children, that we teach our children to believe in our values in our societies, uh, rather than buying into all this stuff from those countries. No, no, no. The West has to stand strong and it has to retain its power in the world. Otherwise, you're going to see a world ruled by Russia and China. And believe you me, believe you me, you do not want that. Um, let, let me uh, talk to you a little bit about comedy here. Um, mm. The health of comedy seems to be that it is sitting up in bed, at least. Uh, it was, I thought, almost dead uh, for a while there. Would not make fun of anything except, you know, those who wouldn't take the jab on COVID. Uh, they, it had become almost state propaganda in in many ways mm -hmm. but now you're seeing comedians start to stand up and i i love this this is from the independent ricky gervais and dave Chappelle. they're unable to evolve their worldview <laughs> <laughs> yeah good for them good for them what's the state yeah. of comedy now well it depends where uh, so if you're talking about the mainstream, if you s turn on your Jimmy Kimmel or your Jimmy Fallon or whatever, these yeah. people that I don't watch anymore, it's all the same garbage that you've seen a hundred times. They haven't changed at all. They're still talking about the same things. They're still uber woke. They still won't make any actual jokes, etc. Even though, by the way, all those people, this is, I sometimes have this issue with people on the right. They're like, Trevor Noah is not funny. Stephen Colbert is not funny. That is not true. They're really, really, really good comedians. But as I always say, ideology ruins everything. Yeah. And the reason they're not funny now is they're put in context where they have to do certain things in order to pander as opposed to be funny. Mm. However, you're absolutely right. And this is why coming back to our earlier conversation about where I'm optimistic about new media, comedy is a very good example of how that happens. Because in comedy, you're either funny or you're not. Right. And if you go out on YouTube and you're not funny, it doesn't matter how ideologically correct you are. No one's going to laugh and no one's going to watch your content. So the people who are fighting back are people like Joe Rogan and Andrew Schultz and Shane Gillis and uh, all these other people. And the reason they're successful is they just make jokes uh, and they have their own audience and they have their own platform. So in America, you guys, are, you know, we were just in Rogan's club. We were on, mm -hmm. on his show. Uh, you know, in America, I, I think in comedy, you guys are actually doing pretty well. 
Uh, and in the UK, we're very, you know, comedians that I speak to, because I used to do stand up, I don't anymore, uh, very jealous of the situation over there. In the UK, much more difficult because we only have one comedy scene, only one comedy circuit. We have one big comedy festival that everybody wow. has to go to to be successful. One set of like six TV commissioners who commission all the comedy that goes out on TV. And all of those people. All, you know, all know each other, as, as someone likes to say, they all marry each other's sisters. It's all a tiny little clique, um, and they're all woke, and they all have the same opinion. So it kind of depends where you are. But in America, I think you guys have every reason to be very optimistic about the future of comedy. You may have already <laughs> given me the answer, but why don't you do stand-up anymore? Why don't you do that? Uh, you know what? Uh, I, I love what I do with trigonometry just so much more. I think stand-up was never quite the ideal career for me. And actually, the real boring answer is I hated the lifestyle. I hated being away from my family. I hated mm -hmm. being on the road five days a week. It just it wasn't for me. I write a lot of satirical columns now on my Substack, and we put a lot of comedy stuff out on our YouTube channel. Uh, that works much better for me. Yeah. Um, who would you say, could you find... Um, a George Carlin, uh, a Lenny Bruce uh, today that you think are, I mean, those guys were, they pushed the edge and said the things, especially Lenny Bruce, but also George Carlin, that said the things that were uh, not comfortable and became legends because of it. Those people exist? Yeah. Well, I think that they do, uh, you know, every comedian goes through various phases of their career. I think you're, you, you're going to see more and more of those people. Uh, we just interviewed, we haven't released the interview yet, but when we were in LA, we interviewed a comedian called Neil Brennan. Uh, and he's a guy that makes fun of both sides incredibly well, I Love find. That. Bill Burr, Bill Burr is a guy that uh, yeah. you know I've historically <laughs> really enjoyed. Yeah. I know he's in a bit of hot water at the moment because he's of fine. his wife and blah blah blah. Yeah. But he's a great comedian. Yeah. Um, and so you know Joe Rogan. I mean, uh, uh, I don't know if he'd be happy with me share, but he he in his latest bit he had this uh, hilarious thing that when he just made me laugh so much. He said we lost a hell of a lot of people during COVID, and most of them are still alive. And I just thought that was such a great <laughs> summation. <laughs> Um, <laughs> He's a really funny guy, Joe. So you, you're going to get people like that for sure. Um, what happened to Russell Brand? It, 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 viewing uh, it from over here, it hmm. seems like all of the people got rich off of him when they knew exactly what he was doing. And now it was convenient to off him. What happened? I think that I think that's accurate. What's going to happen to him? Uh, well, I don't know, because my understanding is there are further allegations that are coming. Uh, so how that lands and look, ultimately, you know, whatever, whatever the rumors are and that, you know, there were a lot of there was a lot of talk in the British comedy industry about his behavior um, at the time, people at the time, at the time, um, ultimately even if if you have your suspicions about people or whatever people have to be convicted in a court of law yeah. otherwise otherwise they you know what what, what can you do so uh, you know until he's convicted unless he's convicted in a court of law he's he's innocent until proven guilty um and so i, I guess unless there are convictions nothing will happen to him is he is he actually being is he going through Court? Has he been charged? I haven't seen any charges against him, just a public well, lynching. Exactly. Exactly. So I, unless, until and unless that happens, I, I don't think anything will happen to him. I think he's continuing to, as far as I know, do his show, and I, I suspect that's what will continue to happen. What? Why, do, why was this brought up? Do you have any idea? Why, why did they go for him? Uh, my understanding, uh, I have friends in the comedy world who were, who've been contacted for comment, etc., for years now. This has been a long-running investigation uh, that came to its conclusion, uh, essentially, in, in, in recent years. Uh, but, of course, I think your point stands. I wrote a whole substack about it at the time. Uh, your point stands, which is, I think, as long while he was making a lot of people a lot of money, they were much less interested in this issue than they are now. Yeah. Great to talk to you. Thank you so much for standing up saying you know what you believe is true and and saying it in an entertaining way i appreciate it i appreciate you glenn thank you for having me god bless